The provisional liquidation of ComAir still raises some questions on what will happen going forward. ComAir has, official, uh, has officially been placed in provisional liquidation by the South, Afri- by the South Gauteng High Court rather, in Johannesburg. Now, this followed the failure of attempts to raise cash to resume operations at Kalula.com and British Airways. All the affected parties have until the 26th of July to provide the court with the reasons why the provisional liquidation order should not be made a final order. The provisional liquidation is also put uh, under the ComAir's franchise agreement with British Airways. To discuss all of this, we're joined on the line by Vincent Manko, the Director for Dispute Resolution Practice at the law firm Cliff decker Hofmeyer. Very good morning to you and welcome, sir. Morning, morning, Albert. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mr. Manko, first tell us more about the business rescue process and, and how it leads to liquidation. And in the case of ComAir, why was this all necessary? Thanks, thanks, Albert. So, uh, as we all know, uh, ComAir was placed in business rescue, I think, almost two years ago now, uh, in 2020 May. The reason ComAir was a candidate for business rescue was because it was in financial distress. So, that meant that it could not pay its, its liabilities within the ensuing six months. So it was a perfect candidate, certainly, for business rescue. But what happened was, pursuant to that business rescue, obviously the, the, the business rescue practitioners have been on an ongoing effort to rehabilitate the company, but unfortunately they couldn't raise the necessary funds. And as soon as the business rescue practitioners then could not raise those funds, they have a statutory duty to then apply to court to put the company in, in, in provisional liquidation. So that, that's the process that has been so far. Mm-hmm. So what happens now to the employees, the customers, or any other stakeholder who were owned monies by the company going through liquidation? That, that is a very important uh, question, Elvis. So um, in any liquidation, there's, there's a, a payment cash uh, waterfall. So, for example, the lenders, most of them would be secure creditors. They will run first. There will be um, uh, creditors who you can call preference creditors. SARS, for example, employees would fall into that category. They are preference creditors, so they get a second bite of the cherry. And then the last uh, 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 sort of creditors, group of creditors, would be your concurrent creditors. Those are unsecured creditors. So your typical uh, ticket holder would, would typically not be secured. So they would sort of be fed in that list, in that ranking. What happened to customers, though, in the commerce situation? Because uh, they probably would need a refund. But when will they receive that refund? After the entire process is complete? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, Elvis, that, that's a, a bit of uh, bad news. I mean, I've seen uh, some, some, some reports that some, some banks have sort of come up with a scheme to, to, to repay their customers or their, their customers. But certainly those, those customers that are not covered by those schemes that, for example, uh, the banks have, have in place. If you're not covered, you unfortunately will be a concurrent creature, and litigation can be quite a long process. I mean, at the minimum, as you're looking at two, three years, possibly four years, in light of, of, of the entity that we're dealing with, it's quite a big entity. So those customers will unfortunately have to wait three, four years maybe, and even then, remember, you're a concurrent creature, so there's no guarantee that you'll get your full repayment. You know, in some instances of liquidation, people get 10 cents in a rent, 20 cents in a rent. But what about those customers that might feel they were duped because just before the liquidation process, uh, there was a sale of tickets from Comair? No, most certainly. Um, uh, uh, those customers certainly will, will have uh, recourse to the court if they do think uh, they've been duped. Certainly they do have that recourse to go to the court. Uh, and and it's not, it, won't, it won't be uncommon for, for liquidation to then generate that sort of litigation. So that is certainly something that, that we've, seen, we've seen before and we, we can expect in, in this instance. Mm-hmm. Now, Comair operated domestic flights in South Africa and the region under the British Airways brand. Now, BA is a separate company from Comair. So what is likely to happen to that agreement and how does the liquidation affect British Airways? So um, at, at, at the granting of the provisional order, um, all, all the agreements uh, that, that uh, Comair was a party to, those agreements then, uh, you know, take an example, an employment contract, those will be terminated by, 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 by operation of law. The other contracts, the trustees, in this instance, would be the provisional liquidators, the final liquidators once they are appointed. They then have an election whether to terminate or the not. In this instance, presumably they will terminate them because ComAir will now finally be, be wound up. So, in so far as the impact on, on the mother 
one person, the mother company, I don't see that much of an impact. That has, let's say, a sort of reputational damage. Mm-hmm. Now, the unions uh, were complaining and uh, pointing the finger at the business rescue practitioner in this uh, process. So what can we now learn about business rescue through the Comia case study? Look, I think, I think there's a couple of, of lessons here that, that we can take. But perhaps the most important one is, you know, any business rescue process, cannot succeed without the necessary funding. I think uh, in the context of this instance, we can call it PCF, post-commencement finance. Without the necessary post-commencement finance, it becomes very, very difficult for any business or practitioner to rehabilitate the business. So that's something that I think is probably the biggest takeaway from, from this lesson. Mm. And is there perhaps a need for more business rescue practitioners, competent business rescue practitioners in the country? No, no, most certainly, Elvis. Uh, that, that's another important thing that you raised. But however, we need to, to put this thing in context. You know that, the listeners will know that business rescue has only been around for, let's say, 10 years or so, because the, the act came into effect in 2011. So certainly there's a lot of competent business practitioners out there, but certainly we could do more. We could certainly do more in terms of skilling our business rescue practitioners. But it's still a young profession, uh, only 10 years or so. I thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, that was uh, Vincent Manku, the Director for Dispute Resolution Practice at Cliff Decker Hoffmeyer Attorneys. So what say you around that issue? And, of course, our question for you, your thoughts on the latest blockade on the N3 by striking truck drivers and should trucking companies be coerced uh, to who they should employ? That's our question for you. If you perhaps uh, were on your way, to Durban on Thursday and you were blocked off. I would also like to know where you are right now if, you, if you've reached your destination in the meantime uh, but you can let me know what's on your mind. Let me go back to some of your comments uh, that we do have here. If I-